she remembers everything. Turn off the refrigerator. Yeah, we're going to have to be warm for a while. Oh, Jesus. All right, I'm going to go with the token. Okay. Tell me when to start. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, and welcome to Allen's Italy. Uh, tonight's show is going to be a little different from what we're used to, what you're used to seeing. You're used to seeing great pictures of Italy and um, all kinds of discussions on art and history and uh, beautiful scenes and landscape. Tonight we're doing something a little different. Uh, whenever I start a new project or a new part of my life, I always want to know, you know, what, what has gone on before I got to that point. And, um, you know, when I became an educator back in 1969, the first thing I did was read a book called uh, 110 Livingston Street, which was a book about the Board of Education. And whenever I get involved in something new, I'd like to, I'd like to know what's going on. So when I became involved in uh, Woodstock Public Access, I was very interested in how everything got started and, and how it got to the point where I entered the picture, which was in the fall of 2011. And one of the people who helped me to orient myself to that was uh, Ellen Povill, who is now my engineer. And she helped me understand a lot of the early things. And also, this book, which is um, a book written by Nancy Kane video days, and uh, I read this a few months ago when the project 
um, was was first begun. I read it again recently, and um, and then Alan put me in touch with uh, two people, and I'd like to introduce them tonight. We have uh, Bart Friedman. Bart. Hi, Alan. Thank you for coming on. My pleasure. And Toby Carey. Thank you very much for taking, taking the time to join us tonight. And these two gentlemen will give us some background as to how this whole thing began, Woodstock Public Access. So the first question I'd like to ask both of you is um, everybody, everybody who lives in Woodstock and who, you know, who settled here came from someplace else. So my question would be, where were you before this and what brought you? To, the, to this area. So we could start with Bart or, or Toby, either one. I was born and <laughs> raised in Brooklyn. <coughs> and uh, I guess I made the hippie migration in the uh, in 1971 from New York City up to Lanesville. Lanesville is a little hamlet just outside of Phoenicia. And I traveled with uh, 10 uh, like-minded video freaks and we set up a uh, we were living cooperatively and uh, communally uh, like a lot of people were in the early 70s and we happened to all do video and art related you know, things why did you choose Lanesville well uh, we had spent we were running out of money in New York and we had spent many weekends jumping in the VW van and driving around the countryside looking for a place that would house 10 people. So I think just before we found Lanesville House, we had been to see the church in Stockbridge where Alice, um, Alice. Uh, Big Toklas? No, Alice of <laughs> Alice's restaurant. She, uh, that would work. Uh, they had converted, her and her boyfriend or husband had converted a church and put, stacked a bunch of bedrooms in the steeple. And of course it was a big beautiful nave and it would have been ideal for a bunch of video producers to use. Those Are these the people? Those same people. I think there was even one other. There was one other for a short time who uh, gave up video to become a, uh, a bot write bodice ripping novels. And I think she did very well. With Probably that. very well. Yeah. How about you? How'd you come up? Well, uh, a similar but different story. Uh, we, uh, meaning myself and my two brothers in our families and a few others, settled in Willow in 1969 before the Woodstock Festival. Uh, June of 69, the festival was that August. Um, we didn't come here because of the music scene. We came here because we had been living communally in New Hampshire uh, for a year before that and we were very unlike anybody else in that neighborhood. We were three miles up a dirt road and it was basically dairy farms and uh, the crazy people at the end of the road which was us. Uh, and we had friends who said well you might want to consider a place like Woodstock close to the city you can probably go back and forth fairly easily. Uh, a cultural uh, uh, interested, interesting kind of place. So we found a place in Willow, we liked it, and we all moved in together. The whole family. Whole family, and a variety of other people, and we lived together for 10 years, and a lot of uh, artists and musicians, and I was the filmmaker in the group, but there we have photographers and architects. And, and uh, growers of wonderful food. Well, we always Talk had about a this. This, yeah. is a, uh, this is a book that uh, a friend of mine named Charlie Higgins at the YMCA, where I exercise a couple of times a week, gave me this book and said that uh, he did not know Toby, but he did know, he mentioned a couple of other people in the family that he knew. And this is a book. Were you part of this book in some Sure, way? sure, yeah. We uh, wrote this book together. We, our group was known as the True Light Beavers, and that has its own story that I won't go into now. but. Um, we produced this cookbook. If you look on the back, you see yes. uh, part of the group plus, right, uh, plus other assorted friends. Um, and this was a, a cookbook meant for cooking for 12 or more people. <laughs> so we kept the communal spirit throughout the book. Uh, and it actually was part of uh, a two-book series that we were 
contracted for by Doubleday. Right. And of course, we were going to make our fortune, which of course never happened. Uh, long, another long story with editors leaving. I read the book. You know, well, good. <laughs> Charlie bought it, and I guess well, I read it. Well, you can still so. find it online. It's uh, somewhat right. collectible, but mm -hmm. this one is even more collectible. What talk about what's that? This is a, you know, you have to pay $65 to get this online. Wow. Crazy, right? Wow. <laughs> and this was the second book in our series, and this is about, we were of the, of the ilk of starting a, a school. We started a school called the Woodstock Community Free School, which ran for about five or six years. Mm -hmm. And as part of that experience, we took a a van load of uh, students and adults and other parents uh, flew down and joined us and we spent a month in Mexico traveling around and living there having great adventures and um, wrote a book about it so wow that was part of that and there's a, a video related story in here that we can talk about when we talk about the history of the channel right you should okay. do your own show you got history here. <laughs> I, I you can do 45 uh, minutes easily. <laughs> Don't get me started. Yeah, right. <laughs> we want to get you started. Yeah. So, so, you see, so you moved to Lanesville. So you moved to Lanesville. And uh, I mean, which, who, who started public access? Which, which one of you was really more involved in public access first? We was got that, and, and one other question I want to ask. Yeah. Was public access in existence before, you know, you started doing it up here well the the there was some public access around the country different spots very little uh operations manhattan in manhattan yeah, yeah manhattan cable i guess but what happened in woodstock was ken marsh and elaine milosh who were involved with another video group called people's video theater uh in in i guess they were in the city uh, Ken and Elaine moved up here in 1971, I want to say. You have the history someplace. Uh, oh, yeah. And they uh, immediately... If this helps. Uh, yeah, if I put up my glasses, it might oh. help. But uh, they, uh, they immediately uh, agitated to get Woodstock uh, have a public access channel because they knew the, uh, the way the cable laws were written in, this, in the state of New York. That was an allowed uh, thing. So uh, after some political struggle, it opened. I was away in Mexico at that time, and, and when I came back, it was already underway, mm -hmm. and I was able to join in that effort, and we had a good run for four or five years and uh, in a variety of things, and including some, some uh, censorship issues and all kinds of usual things that Access seems to get itself involved with around the country. But, but the Lanesville public access, did that begin before the Woodstock, or was that the same time? Uh, I would say uh, <clears throat> by 1972, maybe late 1971, we had a, a what is called America's first pirate broadcast station. Right. There was no cable, there was no television reception in our valley on Route 214 at all. So the people who lived there were primitive, media primitives. They they got very little in the way of television. If they were lucky, they, they could swing their antenna around and catch some fuzzy signal, maybe from Scranton, Pennsylvania, or maybe Albany. But we had, uh, we had a low-power broadcast station which reached, uh, uh, had, well, it was just up and down the valley. There was nobody on this side, on the mountain sides. We reached about a mile and a half up and down the valley, and we covered about 300 houses, and that was our audience. So that was public access, but it was on the airway, not utilizing cable. Now I read in the book that one of the features of the sh of the uh, station was you used to um, walk up and down the streets of Lanesville with a baby carriage, right, and a video camera in That's the right. baby carriage. In the baby carriage, that so kept talk me. About uh, that, a little that bit. made truckers slow down and. Uh, you know, it kept me safe as I walked along the edge of the road. Um, and of course, uh, the nearest neighbor was a half a mile away, so carrying the heavy porter pack and the camera and the batteries and the microphones and the cables and the tapes, you needed to you have need a baby carriage. You needed well. <laughs> if I had to do it today, I would need a full-time chiropractor with me all the time. But well, you were young. You didn't need a. We were young, and we just hurt ourselves. You know? But we recovered quickly. So I wheeled the baby carriage down the road, and I, if I encountered somebody, I would ask them for any current events or news or 
uh, some th things that might be happening in the valley, and it might have been a, a turkey shoot or stocking of the stream, or somebody had a car accident, or somebody got a new tractor, things like that. And it was fascinating to me, and we had an audience. Some people tuned in, called up, made comments. So at the time that that was taking place, was there a, a Woodstock public there, access? There was a Woodstock Simultaneously. Public, we all kind of con concurrently, I would say. Right. And, okay. and I was living in Willow and being a, a, a video maker at that time when I heard that this group had moved in 10 miles away mm -hmm. up the valley. And there weren't many video makers around at that time. We used to know them all, you know, not like today where there is a filmmaker behind every rock, it seems. I was thrilled that they were there, and, and they were like kindred spirits. So whenever I could, I made it my business to go up there, and they would let me edit in their sophisticated editing studio, and, and all they had all this, you know, they had an engineer, and they had stuff that I didn't have. I had a little porta pack, and was trying to edit between two porta packs at one time, and very primitive kind of stuff, and um, glitch filled kind of edits. That was the technology of the time. So I was very happy to meet these guys and they were very welcoming and we had a great time together and I was able to take part in a few of their escapades. You know, we had a, a sh I remember one time we had a, uh, there was an event called Let's Do It in the Road, which was everybody had their porta packs out. And there must have been six or eight people with porta packs in the middle of Route 214, as I recall it. And I don't know what we were shooting other than each other. Uh, but it was a great time, and we had fun, and, and that was the spirit. And then we piled all our monitors oh, yeah, up right. in like a pyramid That's in the right. living room and plugged all our porta packs in and played right from the first frame, everybody. And we all watched each other's half-hour video of the same time That's frame right. on the same road. And <laughs> it was, was, uh, it was a, a terrific... It was a lot of fun. I think there's a picture of that in Nancy's book. Oh yeah, I think well, so. I hope so. I've yeah, seen someplace a picture uh, of that. I have, I have a few pictures from, from Nancy's book. Let's see what we have. Oh, that's, that's the, okay, that's. Oh uh, my God! Where did that come from? I have. I, I don't know where a lot. You know, I created the show several months ago. <laughs> Do you know that picture? Uh, yes, I have it on my in my studio. I've never seen. I love the print of that. That's, that's awesome. a great picture. That's right. a great picture. Well, he's got it scanned, so it's already okay. digitized. Okay. Oh, you can you can send it. To I can you. send it to you. Let me show you what I have, and you could. Oh yeah. There's somebody. Yeah. That's the way you looked back back then. That's, so what what's this? A uh, photographer from, Hor from Horizon magazine, in those days it was a hardcover magazine called Horizon, and I, I don't know if they still exist, but they sent a photographer up to document it. They did a, an article on communal life in America, and they traveled around to different collectives, and they stopped to visit us and took that great picture. That was our kitchen. That's you behind the camera, right? That's me behind the camera, yes. And who are the other people? In well, the kid with the bozo mask is uh, one of the kids who lived uh, down by the general store. Parry is in the silk high hat carrying mm -hmm. his daughter, Sarah. And the fellow with the beard is uh, David Court, who is uh, one of the guys. Right, okay. And this is... Uh this was our technician. Uh, now, is this, is this Lanesville or? This is in Lanesville, that's right. in our control room. You know, because there were 10 of us, we were able to you know, combine our resources and make our equipment pretty sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Plus, we're very lucky to have that guy, Chuck, who was a, an equipment geek. He, he, he was a, a brilliant technician. Yeah, I like to experiment, he liked to take things apart and build them, rebuild them, invent them. He was a hacker, he was the original hacker, really. And Nancy uh, was one of the women in Video Freaks. Or At that time we were becoming Media Bus. Right. We, we became a not-for-profit. And then we, took, we uh, managed to get a few grants from the State Arts Council, which helped us a lot. Okay, this is... This is from, uh, we went back to New York City uh, to do some coverage of uh, um, Jimmy Carter or, or Ronald Reagan's inaugura not inauguration uh, conventions. 
I guess it had to do with Republican and Democratic. One conditions. of the things she uh, these are all these are all video to... producers who were like bicycling tapes. It was called the five day bicycle race. The idea was you go out and shoot a half hour, bring it back to the studio, put it right onto the decks out to Manhattan Cable and uh, unedited, and it just went on for days. People coming in, bringing their tapes, and when there weren't tapes to queue up and play, it was the live people in the studio who were taking a break or charging their batteries. Okay. And these are some of the early... Now, so why did you leave Lanesville and come to Woodstock? And, and is that when you two kind of combined? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just tell my part was... Uh, there were ten of us, and eventually people started to grow up and decided they had they needed to plan and make families and have real careers because we made no money really. Living out there, we forgot about our careers and our, you know, becoming middle class. And uh, so everyone basically went their own way, leaving Nancy and me and Chuck. Chuck wound up uh, getting married and moving to New Paltz and starting a family and Nancy and I decided to come to Woodstock and that's when uh, we teamed up with Toby, and that was the, for the second incarnation of Woodstock Access Television. Right. Yeah, it's interesting because Woodstock, as I said, Woodstock Access TV had existed for about five years, and then it fell dormant. Uh, Ken and Elaine moved to Rhinebeck, and they started something called the Artist TV Lab, which was a little different. It wasn't a cable access thing, but it was video art related kinds of projects, and it was it was a lot of fun also. But that left the void. And so we were off the air, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then when Bart and Nancy came back, uh, came to Woodstock, uh, it was there was an effort to start the channel as a public access channel again, which ran into political difficulties right away. There were people who were... It seemed they were agreeable about letting us hook up the cable, but they had no idea what kind of program <laughs> right. we had. Uh, that, well, we didn't plan have anything planned. That, we just knew something would be giving birth to something. Right. And then the shit hit the fan. Right. So you started with nothing, basically. Because here, you know, the, these are some of the early shows. And, um... Yeah, yeah I, I actually, I brought a... I brought a, a version of the Night Owl show that Nancy and I did. Uh, we, we produced a weekly show. Ruth and Ellen produced a weekly show, The Minority Report. David Boyle later, I think after we left, we were we we formed a not for profit which we called W uh, Woodstock Access Television, a real not for profit, and we uh, formed a board of directors who were people from town, and we helped manage the station for ten years, and basically all most of our energy was keeping the station on the air. I mean, we could have done much more in the way of programs. It's a nice variety. I have a few more over here. These are some of the things that uh, Ellen. Do you have uh, Do you have the uh, velvet trick? Yes, you do. Yeah, yeah. that was. Uh, I have I have boxes of videos that Ellen and Ruth shot of the velvet trigger show and. Right. Uh, and minority. I have minority reports home too in boxes. One of the other shows, I, I don't know if it's on uh, another list, but it was one that I did weekly also called This Is Not The News. And yes. It was a magazine show. Yes. Um, oh, I don't... And uh, it included... I don't, much, uh, I don't have that well, one. Well, it's okay. It did exist. And, okay. Um, yeah, I have. Uh, a, whole, a whole variety of things, some of which were uh, tapes that I had made apart from that. Some were live things. I also did something at the very beginning called Soapbox of the Air. It was anybody could come in and say anything they wanted for 15 minutes. They had their their free time, basically. And that went on for a while. And, you know, things change and you get bored with something, you try something new, and that's the way it worked here as well. Right. And we were always trying to keep the tech going and keep it upgraded and didn't have much support from the powers that be. And there was a franchise fee that was collected and still is collected from cable uh, viewers, uh, subscribers, and went into the coffer. We didn't get to see it to upgrade our equipment, so we were fighting for that. Our equipment was donated all by the producers when we first started. The lights, the 
tape recorders. The was it this mixers. studio? Was it right it here? It was this studio, yeah. 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 And at that time, there was uh, the this studio was. I think they cut the beams or something. So when there was commotion here, or commotion out there, it wouldn't interfere with the pro. It, it, it got some soundproofing. I, that's about all that they did for us. It's not very good soundproofing. Well, so there, there was once a Spanish dancer doing castanets and. Oh. That was oh. driving me crazy. Yeah. She was going on while I was trying to do a show. That was she really. Should have done uh, <laughs> Alan Sabia. But but it's interesting because this is so relatively sophisticated compared to what we had to work with. You've got equipment banks and such yeah. that yeah. didn't really exist then. And in fact, I'll just go back to the first incarnation of Woodstock Access TV. We had a um, a production studio over at Panarsa Square, but there was no cable drop in town. So we couldn't put on our cable shows from town originally. We had to go up the mountain to Meads Mountain oh, yes. and go right over uh, across um, California Quarry Road to an existing concrete bunker type building which had the head end which is what feeds the cable to to the subscribers. And we literally had to plug our porta packs we take a porta pack up there with tapes and plug it right into the modulator right at the head end up on California Quarry Road, and we, they had to have a guy come up from Kingston, Kingston Cablevision at that mm -hmm. time, to unlock the door because mm -hmm. he didn't trust us with the key. You know, it was just, you know, this very rudimentary kind of mm -hmm. setup. And in fact, I got in trouble one day because I brought back a tape from this trip in Mexico on a childbirth, and I wanted to show it. I thought it was a great thing; everyone should see a, a live childbirth. Well, I plugged it in and started playing, and as soon as I got to the real birth section. The guy from Kingston Cable freaked out so much that he literally pulled the plug. Really? <laughs> so that that thing about pulling the plug, it does right. happen. It did happen. So that was a bit of uh, craziness that went on. Round two of public access in Woodstock, uh, I think uh, we found that the head end was in the uh, town hall, right? Right. Where the police upstairs. dispatcher was, and we right. had to go through a trap door to plug in That's there. Right. But I forgot about that. Yeah. That's Upstairs, what I remember. Yeah. That's how. That's how I remember. So us you actually had to climb Mead, Mead Mountain and bring all your, you know, equipment. Oh up. yeah, that's yeah. Snow or rain or whatever. That's how we got on the air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's okay. it was. <laughs> I, I knew it was going to be an interesting story. So thank you very much yeah, for yeah. that. Now, can we show some things? Yeah, you should show this uh, all right. overview. From what the, would you like to show first? So this is an overview uh, edited. To uh, an edit that Nancy did of uh, what was going on in Woodstock in, well, let's see, we were on the board from 71 when we started, um, uh, I'm sorry, 81. until 78 or 79 when we, yeah. when we restarted the station for 10 years. That's right. So somewhere maybe in the middle of that, so 1980, well, it had to be earlier, 1982, say. 1982, uh, this is what was going on in Woodstock, and this is how Channel 6 at that time, we were Channel 6, right. this is how we saw it, and, uh, uh, and if you need explanation afterwards, we'll be happy to. Okay, so Ellen, you ready? Yes. Okay, roll it. I always wanted to say that. Show next on uh, Channel 6. To give you the opportunity to yeah. say that. There it is. There it comes. Good evening. Is there audio in the studio? You suicidal vermin. Good evening, you poison clutching demons. Good evening to all of you death lovers. People have told me that all you want to do is find a way to dramatically die. Well, tonight you will not die, but I will kill you.
people dying of cancer are not writing poems, praying in California sun, holistic healers, never happening, losing breasts to the ready knife, and bravely getting tattooed on the spot, while hearty dark-eyed friends, remembering grandmother, pray, no harm will come to you, no harm will come to urine-sodden sheets and 80 pounds at the end of your life. 80 to 90 percent of all cancers are produced by environmental pollutants. They're preventable. I've said that. We don't. It's no use treating cancer once it occurs. It's too late. Have you ever seen a person die of cancer? Have you ever seen a child come into a hospital with some bruises? Have a blood picture done? Got leukemia? Put in a little room all by himself? Treated with nasty drugs? Make him feel sick? His parents can't see him unless they wear a mask and a gown. He lies in a state of abject terror while everyone smiles at him. And two weeks later in the middle of the night, he dies bleeding from his mouth, nose and rectum. It was disclosed today that the recent accident at Three Mile Island was not caused by human hair as was originally suspected, but in fact by equipment malfunction. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission today said that human hair, human air that is, was a major factor, but the Congressional Task Force looking into the accident claims that equipment failure played an even bigger role. People dying of cancer are not writing letters to congressmen or to you, not marching, not shouting, not bombing, not rebelling, not shaking their fists in the pestilent air, heartless, inviolate, the pestilent air disguised as a lover plants its insidious caress on grandmothers, lovers. California, Oklahoma is really a rapist. The air invades lung, liver, cervix, breast, bladder, while the muse recoils in dizzy horror and hardy dark-eyed poets tear their own hair. Einstein predicted that this would happen. He said, I wish I'd been a locksmith. Back live. We're back live. I, I put the uh, wrong disc in my pack, but that was uh, part of what we played on uh, Channel 6 back in the day. It's I meant to bring something that was funny, okay. but this was not funny. Well, it doesn't have to be funny. No, I understand. You know, it's, it, was, it was great, and it was good. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. And don't feel bad about bringing the wrong you know, tape. I, make mistakes like that all the time. Yeah, well I meant to, as this Mag magazine used to say, I, I wanted to do something in the jugular vein. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Okay, Thank so you. you have something too, right? What do you have? Well, I, I, I brought um, one episode of This Is Not The News, right. oh, and good. I don't know what even on it anymore. Uh, which You want to play it for a few minutes, Alan? Yeah, just a few minutes. Um, it's on a DVD, and um, so whatever there is, we can see a little bit. I don't remember what segments are on here. We did a lot of, of things. We did things about uh, the Gypsy Moth invasion. We did things mm -hmm. uh, yeah. about weddings. What we, year was the Gypsy Moth invasion? Because <laughs> I was just, I saw somebody, somebody was unpacking the groceries the other day and they took out a can of Crisco. Oh yeah. That's and I right. said, Crisco? I said, the last time I used Crisco, I was smearing it around my trees to keep the Gypsy Moths from crawling. That's right. That's right. you get caught. Good. Yeah. Right, yeah. Good. Here we go. Good, yeah. Good, with it. Good evening. Welcome to This Is Not The News. Tonight we will be presenting fall and spring. <laughs>
Oh, it looks beautiful. This is such a big, healthy thing. I'm not sure that's... You're saying, I love these flowers, too. Well, your fingers more. Hmm, <laughs> Prinny. You love being outside and working with us, don't you, sweetie pie? Whoops, that's too hard. I can't dig in there. Okay, so we're back live. Okay, so those are some of the early broadcasts, and um, I guess you guys moved on Not and really. left the <laughs> and left the state and left left the station in the hands of you know people like Ellen and, and Ruth and other people. Yeah, and they carried on. There was a revolution here, actually. Uh, Toby and myself and six or so other people were running the station like autocrats. Uh, I mean, we kept it democratic and we kept it on the air, but then a group of producers basically made our lives so miserable we had to leave. Hmm. And they took over and it was perfect, you know. Right. There was hard feelings at first, but actually that's what needed to happen. They, you know, the next generation. Right. I mean, Things and, move on. That's and right. I'm, I'm part of that new phase of the of the studio. Well, you're probably in the third or fourth generation of uh, Woodstock Access Television. I feel young when people say I'm in the fourth generation. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Even though I'm in my, you know, whatever. Anyway, so first you and then, and then Toby. What are you doing now? Well, I have to say, luckily, uh, I don't know how I was so lucky, but I, I, I haven't changed at all. I still, I am now on the advisory board of the Sorgades Public Access Station. And as you know, Sorgades is a much different community than Woodstock. But there's money in, there's money in Sorgades, at least for public access. Mm -hmm. But it's not from Time Warner, and it's not from, well, Sorgades provides us with a beautiful studio and control room and uh, a corporation and some benefactors have provided equipment and know-how. and So we have a beautiful studio and uh, I, I'm still personally, uh, I still produce videos. I still do bar mitzvahs and weddings. Mm -hmm. I still cover art events. I still do personal documentaries and I still uh, take employment. Uh, it's no different, really, and I, I feel very lucky that I haven't had to change. Okay, and Toby? Still here, after all these years, as they say, you know, and uh, still producing uh, documentaries, for the most part. Still working with uh, various artists, doing a lot of editing for people, mm -hmm. um, and working on a lot of regional historical documentaries. Right. Uh, some about... Um, 19th century kinds of things, though one I'm currently working on is a history of railroads in the Catskills, mm -hmm. and I thought I was just going to be a nice little historical documentary, and now there's a political controversy about rails versus trails, or oh, rails yeah. and trails, and now I can't finish my tape until oh, this thing... Oh, lucky, you're so lucky. You know, there's some kind of... <laughs> things happen when you, up. when you, you hang on long enough. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's the Italy connection. The here's Italy the Italy connection. connection. Yes is you did a documentary on Leonardo's horse. That's right. And um, in Milan, and there is the horse. Picture taken by Bart. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't know I was getting you both into this yeah. This part of it. And, uh, Wait a minute, I gotta get it. Okay, you wanna go back to that? You don't have that on? Okay, there he is with the horse. This was in the uh, Talix Foundry in uh, down near Beacon, uh, which I think is out of business now. Although I've seen that name someplace else, and someone may have taken the name over. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a long process of uh, following the creation of this horse, and uh, ended up 
following it all the way to Milan, where it got installed in the mm -hmm. racetrack outside of the city itself, and they had a, a glorious opening. Okay. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And why is, why is, what, what's the concept of, there it is, installed, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So Leonardo's horse. So here's Leonardo. Here's Leonardo, and he had a design for this horse, um, which he was going to cast in one piece, uh, in lost wax process, in the sand, uh, and he did a, a clay mock-up of it, uh, and then he started uh, figuring out how to use the bronze, and Milan was invaded. He was under the protection of the, the Duke of Milan, basically, whose mm -hmm. name I don't remember at the moment. Uh, but Sforza. Sforza. Exactly right. right. Very good. Mr. I'm back to Italy. Yeah. I'm yeah. back to Italy, yeah. And um, they shot the, uh, the horse full of arrows, and then they took the, the metal that was going to be used for casting it and made bullets out of it. So that was the end of his horse. All that existed was a little drawing, uh, sketches. And uh, there was an American uh, from Pennsylvania who had this idea to recreate that horse. Uh, that horse was from 1492 originally, so well, five it was like 500 years later. This this fellow had the idea, and uh, he started making the horse. And his sculpture wasn't very successful. Uh, the, and they had a foundation supporting it. And then they hired a wonderful sculptress whose specialty was animals. Nina Akamu, and she came and basically started over again and recreated this beautiful uh, horse. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to be involved in documenting it. So. Do we have time, Alan, for that? To play the, 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 DVD? the, the Leonardo? Yeah. The horse thing? Oh, there's railroads, yeah. That's what I'm involved in now. Yeah. I took a few pictures while we're getting ready for that. I don't know if it's showing on the. Well. Okay. She's nothing like a good All right. controversy. Actually made in this country and then shipped over. Correct. Oh, it's yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. I guess it's still there. I haven't been back since uh, wherever that was. Was it there was some controversy about putting it in the airport versus putting it in the middle of the town square or some place? Yeah, it ended up at the racetrack, which is probably a good place for it. <laughs> but there was some controversy it's outside about where of it was town. Going to go, and there was kind of a political fight about who was going to get the horse and did they want it, did they not want it. Really Italian, you know, so right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. But uh, came from okay. a foundation. And who paid for this? Uh, there was a foundation that they established in Pennsylvania, the Leonardo da Vinci Horse Inc. or whatever, and uh, raised money. They had an education center. And, uh, I don't even know if they're still in business or what's going on. They never, uh, although I did all this documentation, they never asked for a complete edit of, the, of all the tape that I shot. I would make, um, when they were doing this, they wanted publicity, of course, so I would make segments as the thing was going on, and they would send them out. So I played it on CNN and Hong Kong right. and all around the world, different segments, but I never got to finish one, one complete edit. I still have 40 hours of tape mm -hmm. sitting on the shelf waiting for some benefactor to come along and say, yes. The same thing yeah. So 
my, so my question is, when you were in Milan, did you get a chance to do any sightseeing? Yes, yes. We walked every day from our hotel all around Milan and saw a lot of the city, went to some museums and right. had wonderful food. Of course, being crude Americans, we would show up to restaurants much before they were open. Too early, right. you know. And they don't so, open until 7.30. Right, so, so we learned, right. you know, right. take your time, have a drink or two, and then come back. Exactly. And, and exactly. Uh, so we did that. Exactly. We went to Lake Como and had a, a nice tour of that. Right. So it was fun. We had a nice time. I went I went there. Do you uh, remember what hotel you stayed at? I do not. Okay, these are things that, like, you yeah. know, kind of stick remember. with me. So I guess I went we're there a couple uh, of times. I guess so we're, we're just about done. Five minutes. Time flies. Okay. Would well, you like to play that Channel Six overview? Do we have to, Do we have time for that? The Channel Six overview. Yeah. Let's do that. See, I was going to ask you what you think the future of public access is, but we'll do that. But the future of public access is probably YouTube. Although yeah. uh, we now, uh, I, I think Woodstock led the way <clears throat> in streaming programming. Do you? There was some streaming from Woodstock a few years ago. It streams occasionally. occasionally. It doesn't always work, but sometimes it does. A lot of people like to watch, people from different parts of the country like to watch this show live, yeah. streaming. And they're uh -huh. very frustrated sometimes when they try and they can't uh -huh. do it. Oh, uh -huh. it's just technical. One of whom is my ex-wife, who uh -huh. I told her to watch tonight. So you put <laughs> it up on YouTube. And, the and then I put it up on YouTube when I get home. Mm -hmm. And um, I've had... Uh, I mean, it varies. Sometimes I get like 75 hits a week, but this particular week, for some reason, I've had about 175 hits on a show, I, you know, on, on various shows. I think that may have something to do with the fact that I'm actually teaching a course in the New Paltz Continuing Education Program, and I think a lot of the students, you know, are going to that and they're looking at it, so uh, that could be the reason. I hope there are alternatives to YouTube. Uh, I, I hope well, there are uh, more, more, Vimeo more now, because is one. Okay. Okay, you want to do it for a few minutes? Here's Woodstock. Channel 6 is something like having a, a talking dog. I'm the real Santa Claus. It hardly says things like, um, please pass the butter, or to be or not to be. But when you get him down to the bar, he just says arf. Blues. Oh. But believe me, at home, Channel 6 is amazing. For example, here's what some people are saying about it. I don't want it coming into my house. If this is what is going to happen, no, we've been through that. Censored, but we've been using news. I don't want to pull the plug on Channel Six per se. I want to pull the plug on homosexual love or whatever that was. This issue. In my house, I'm a lesbian, and I am really, really upset about you. What is your name? Carl Van Wagen. Carl. Mm -hmm. I can't, I mean, unfortunately, I can believe that you said that. But I'm really appalled. I'm really appalled to live in a town that seems so rabid with homophobia. I don't Ooh. mind your homosexuality. I don't want it in my house. Well, hey, don't invite me over. <laughs> <laughs> not invite it on my TV either. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Your TV, not now these people are talking about this show. They're not talking about this show. I've always loved her. And they're not talking about this show either. One, two, three, four, five, six. Until you see a light inside the head. One, two, three, four, five, six. And one more time. One, two, three, four, I like to think of Channel 6 as being loaded with danger, intrigue, and adventure. But I know that we're mostly just plain folks. Town hall, you know, town meeting thing with the very interesting. And it's probably in Nancy's book. Uh, yes, it is. She yeah. talks about it to a great extent. It's interesting. Nancy uh, seemed to, like when I read the book, I said, "My God, she has a photographic memory." But she had all the tapes, 
she she recorded a uh, Pat Robertson and Pat Boone sitting on a park bench when she moved to California, and they were speaking to each other in tongues, and she quoted verbatim in her book the the conversation that yeah, they were having yeah. in tongues. I said, how did she do that? But of course, she had uh, she transcribed yeah. it from the. It's thing. a great book. It's a great. I, book. I've read it twice, and I'll probably probably read it again. Wow. Well, in Nancy, the meantime, if you're watching this online, just kisses. <laughs> yes, yeah, say say hello to all your yeah. friends and relatives. All your relatives, Hi, gentlemen. Hi, Meg. Bart, thank you very much. Thank you, for and your time. Totally Thanks thank for you having very, us. Very much. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Next week we are going back to Italy, and we're going to Rome and talking about my favorite piazzas in Rome. Wow. So lucky you. Uh, thank you for watching, and uh, on behalf of all three of us. Buona notte e buona fortuna. And buona provecho. I do.